Saigon Sam here, July 21st, 2011. I'd like to talk to you a little bit about food safety as pertains to canned fish. Now, here in Asia, canned fish is a, a staple part of the diet for many people, myself included. Uh, the problem is that in a lot of places in Asia, uh, the local fish that's available uh, is either freshwater fish, which is an absolute no-no in, in Asia these days, or uh, is, a, uh, is an ocean fish which has gone through an undescribable, unknown uh, handling process, which may or may not be clean, which may or may not involve preservative chemicals, which may or may not involve the fish having been scraped across the deck of a lead paint coated boat. I mean, you just don't know. Right? So uh, what I like to do um, is I like to buy a Japanese canned fish. Maybe you're closer to, uh, to Europe and so you might want Portuguese sardines or maybe you're, you're near Canada, you get uh, New Brunswick sardines or whatever, or Alaskan fish. Um, I tend to avoid, by the way, salmon, which uh, I, I've heard a lot of it is mislabeled as ocean raised when in fact it's farm raised. Or some of it is, is actually ocean raised, but it's raised in these uh, basically net enshrouded pens, if you will, in the ocean where the salmon are, are fed uh, animal byproducts from land animal farming. So, uh, yeah, getting clean fish is actually a trickier problem than it sounds. Now, here as applies to Asia, now we have the Fukushima you know, nuclear disaster, which makes things even more complicated. So, here we have Japan, which usually has very, very high hygienic standards and food standards, but now they've got this horrible in environmental disaster, and none of us really understand, let's admit it, uh, how fish migrate and exactly when, and what the probability is that a given fish would have eaten a chunk of cesium or something um, on its way back out of the exclusion zone to be caught. So um, even though, you know, maybe only one in a thousand or I don't know, one in a million fish is, has got toxic levels of radiation in it, I don't think we understand the statistical distribution well enough to be really confident that we can just eat this stuff blindly even if it's caught outside the exclusion zone. Um, and furthermore, you have to realize that the dis distribution of that radiation is going to change over time, right? As it gets swept out to sea, uh, the good news is it's going to get dispersed, but the bad news is the average level of exposure to fish in the area may increase. Um, so rather than trying to do all this math on a data set, on a data set, frankly, that we don't understand very well, um, I've decided to get one of these. This is a fabulous spur scientific Geiger counter. Uh, basically, um, it's quite simple. You just push this button. You can see it's on now. And there it goes. Hear that? Yeah, so once in a while it pops, and it pops in, uh, in response to a, a gamma particle uh, that, is, that is a highly energetic photon, or an X-ray, which is also highly energetic, but not so much, um, or, or a beta particle, uh, beta positive or, or beta negative, either one, intersecting the Geiger-Muller tube, which is this metal tube here. Um, now, it won't detect all kinds of radiation or all energies of radiation. Uh, you'd have to check the product spec for yourself. This happens to be model 840026, and if memory serves, it, it uh, detects beta particles from half a mev to 1.5 mev, me mega electron volts. Now, as I understand, uh, if my research with Wolfram Alpha is correct, then all the types, the isotopes of the radioisotopes of iodine, cesium, and strontium that uh, have been emitted by Fukushima will be detected by this meter. But I'm sure there are other people that have made uh, much more thorough investigations of all that and could tell you much more, uh, much better, um, whether this meter will detect absolutely everything that came out of that plant or whether you want a better meter. I'm not really here to discuss that so much as the general principle of owning one of these, whichever one that you, you deem appropriate uh, for your needs. Um, and using it to analyze this. Now, this is uh, a lovely uh, canned fish um, uh, canned fish meal by Honiho Corporation, H-O-N-I-H-O, -I out of Japan. You can Google them. This is uh, Pacific Sori. Uh, sori is about, I don't know, a foot long or something. Um, it's a little bit bigger fish than I usually like to eat. If you eat uh, big fish like tuna, you're going to probably be exposed to more mercury. Uh, of course, if you eat very small fish, then you have a risk of domoic acid poisoning uh, when there's uh, a particular type of algae that infects an oceanographic area. Um, I believe uh, red tide algae, if I'm not mistaken, but I might be wrong about that. Um, domoic acid, D-O-M-O-I-C, acid. Um, it's something you should just Google and understand about. And, and while I'm on the topic, by the way, from the research I've read, if you gut the fish before you eat it, uh, because some of these canned fish do contain guts. <laughs> um, if you've got the fish, uh, your chances of getting domoic acid poisoning, or at least your exposure concentration, would be about one part in seven uh, relative to if you had left 
the, uh, the guts in. So you'd have only 14% as much exposure uh, in the event of a domoic poisoning uh, episode. Um, anyway, I don't want to get into all that, I just thought I'd mention it because a lot of people don't know that mercury is not the only major hazard in the ocean <laughs> when it comes to fish, even in clean areas of the ocean. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to take my, my lovely Geiger counter here and I'm going to put it up close to this, uh, <laughs> this specific story and I don't expect to find anything but uh, I might as well cover my bases, right? Now, by the way, according to the manual, and I'm not saying this goes for all Geiger counters, but for this particular Geiger counter, um, it, you want to expose the Geiger-Muller tube, the GM tube here, directly uh, to the sample that you're measuring. And the reason for that is because if you turn it around, the meter itself tends to shield from beta particles. So you may fail to detect the sample that's emitting a goodly amount of beta. Now, the other tricky thing about uh, counting a <laughs> radionuclide concentration, you have to remember, is that radio, radioactive decay is, is a completely statistical process. In other words, I can't predict when a given nucleus is, is going to blow up and, and, fiss, and fissile, right, and fission. Um, and for that reason, if you really want an accurate estimate of the radioactive, um, radioactivity of a substance, you have to count pops over a long period of time, several minutes. Now, of course, if, if it's popping like continuously, then you know there's a serious problem, in which case uh, you probably just shouldn't need it. Um, and in any event, I think possibly these are at worst like twice as radioactive as the background in my room. Um, I haven't measured it really accurately. That could be a misstatement. It might actually be less, but it's, it's within such a small band of radioactivity one way or the other that it doesn't matter to me. Now, I might buy another one tomorrow that's a thousand times, right? So that's why I have this, so I don't have to trust the government, I don't have to listen to anybody, I can just measure it myself. Okay, here we go. So, first of all, this is background. I don't know, a few seconds there, we got like five pops or something. Now let me hold it, as I said, here's, here's the GM, the Geiger-Miller tube. I'm going to hold it right close to the, to the fish here. Now, I don't know, it seems about, seems about the same to me. Um, now one thing is that this metal packing may block beta radiation. So I'm going to go ahead and open this. Here we are. There's some sauce in there. Uh, you probably can't see this, but uh, there's some uh, sauce in there and that's uh, probably not healthy stuff. I probably want to pour that out. I hope I'm not pouring out dissolved uh, suspended omega-3, but that's life. Uh, so okay, so I, I actually have the fish exposed. Um, and let's try it again. Okay, it's essentially, it's essentially nothing. As I, I can't tell any clear discernible difference between this fish and the air in the room. So I guess we're in pretty darn good shape. And I'm going to have lunch. But uh, before I go, one other thing. Uh, it occurred to me, you know, if you, think of, if you don't think of a Geiger counter for a moment, you think of a cell phone, right? What does a cell phone do? Well, it emits radiation uh, somewhere around 2.5 gigahertz, I think, and it goes to a tower, and then radiation comes back when people are talking to you. And so it's, it's exchanging radiation with the environment. Not nuclear radiation, but, you know, uh, basically gigahertz-type radiation. Um, now, it occurred to me that if these are also dealing in the currency of radiation, if they're receiving radiation, that they might produce radiation. Well, um, before you laugh, it's actually not as simple as you might think. I think the, the general answer is the amount of radiation this could produce is essentially meaningless. However, it's not a, a totally straightforward question because the way that the machine manages the machine, the way that this meter manages to produce the pop sounds is that basically when a charged particle, a heavily a very energetic charged particle strikes the tube, it sets off a chain reaction whereby a, a current of ions goes one way and the current of electrons goes another way. And I always get anode and cathode mixed up. So I think I think the electrodes flow toward the anode and the ions flow toward the cathode, but I probably have that backwards. Anyway, so the important point though is that when the electrons crash into either either the shell or the wire through the middle, um, the wire through the middle is the anode, I'm pretty confident of that. But when the electrons crash into one side or the other, um, they may produce a kind of radiation known as Bremsstrahlung radiation. Bremsstrahlung radiation is essentially breaking radiation, meaning that it's the radiation that's produced when electrons of high energy crash into matter. And sometimes Bremsstrahlung radiation can be in the X-ray region. Um, in, in this case, we're dealing with, according to the manual, something, uh, something north of uh, 200 volts DC. So you're accelerating an electron uh, through a small distance, I guess two or three millimeters, at uh, about 200 volts, so 
you know, you do the math, you can find out how much energy is in that electron, you can find out, in the worst case, what the radiation frequency would be going out and what the flux would be. I think at the end of the day, if you do the analysis, you might find, you might find that this will emit some trivial amount of x-rays, but I doubt it's anything to be concerned about, even, frankly, if you use it every single day. Because it did occur to me, right, that people who use these tend to use them very, very rarely, and would it matter if you used it every single day to test your food? Um, probably not, even if it does produce radiation. I'm sure somebody will want to post a video telling me why I'm all full of nonsense and why this doesn't produce any x-rays at all, which is entirely possible. I'm just raising the possibility. So um, that's it. That's all for me. Uh, I think I'm going to have lunch. Talk to you later. Bye-bye.